It's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Han Fu Min, Senior Energy Economist at IRIA, to moderate the first panel of the day on natural gas versus renewable energy as transition energy. Dr. Han, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lydia. Just confirm, do you hear me? We do. Loud okay, and clear. Thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, Professor uh, Jun Arima for providing a very uh, good background for, I think, for the whole uh, panel discussion for today. And also uh, thank Lydia, my colleague, for, uh, I, I think, uh, give me the floor to uh, moderate this session. Uh, first of all, I would like to say a very good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants from different parts uh, of the regions. Uh, I am Han Puman, a senior energy economist with Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, today, I'm very honored to serve as moderator of this uh, panel session one on the natural gas and renewable as an energy transition in ASEAN at this important force, East Asia Energy Forum. As you all are aware that the pursuit of net zero emission is starting and ASEAN will need to act now in terms of energy policy design to ensure that the smooth transition toward net zero emission will not leave anyone behind by balancing energy affordability, energy accessibility, reliability, and energy security. In this regard, how natural gas and LNG can be accelerated and used in a responsible manner and cleaner in supporting ASEAN energy transition, and how renewable energy can be scaled up as fast as possible by ensuring the other important uh, uh, of energy uh, affordability for economic development as well as for energy security in, in ASEAN. Uh, today we have assembled a terrific uh, panel list to discuss on this topic on the role of natural gas and renewable in supporting ASEAN energy uh, transition. Uh, we have Dr. Dimitris uh, Sokolo, he is the head of the uh, Department of Energy Economic and uh, Forecasting Department from Gas Exporting Country Forum, uh, GCF. Uh, He's going to share his insight about the prospect of natural gas uh, in the world as well as in ASEAN and its crucial role in energy transition. And we will proceed by uh, Mr. Benny uh, Sujadi. So, so Manager of Power, Fossil Fuel, Alternative Energy and Storage from ASEAN Center for Energy. He's going to share the progress of ASEAN uh, uh, on energy development to achieve ASEAN renewable target and other key policy in ASEAN to promote future de development of ASEAN clean energy transition. And then we will have uh, His Excellency Victor Juna, uh, the Under Secretary of State, Ministry of Mine and Energy of Cambodia. He's going to share his insight about the renew renewable energy development in Cambodia and other energy policy development to promote renewable energy in Cambodia. And we will have also Dr. Norasikin Ahmad Ludin, the Associate Professor of Solar Energy Research Institute from the University of Malaysia to share her insight about the Malaysia energy policy development and the role of biomass to decarbonize the emission to support ASEAN energy transition. Uh, I think we, I have introduced the uh, uh, panelists and without further ado, I just would like to invite Dr. Dimitri uh, to, to share insight first and uh, proceed by Pat Benny and Dr. Dr. Uh, His Excellency Victor Zona and uh, Nora Sikin, Dr. Nora Sikin. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Dimitri, uh, could you please uh, take the floor? The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Fomin. Good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening, all participants, excellencies, distinguished guests. Uh, warm greetings from Doha, the state of Qatar, headquarters of uh, GCF. Gas Exporting Countries Forum. My name is Dmitry Sokolov, and today I would like briefly to share with you our view on the development of natural gas uh, energy systems uh, in the region of ASEAN and East Asia. 
before I start, I just uh, let me share the screen. I just want to confirm that the screen is shared. Great. We see it. So, yes, we see it. Yes, Dr. So I would like uh, to mention that the presentation uh, slides, uh, which I'm going to support my speech today, are going to be shared by the, our good friends uh, from area. Uh, definitely, this is a GCF view on uh, development of the natural gas industry in the coming uh, three decades. And uh, this view is uh, supported by the organizations that gathers 70% uh, of natural gas reserves in the world, 18 countries, leading gas exporters. Uh, first of all, I uh, would like to say that uh, uh, GCF are very proud to be a partner of this forum and definitely from the first uh, meeting, which happened in August 2017 in Bohol, Philippines, uh, GCF uh, support uh, with our own view on development of energy systems in the region. We definitely, uh, uh, during the last four years, uh, worked hard on uh, providing our insights as a gas exporting countries forum to the development. Uh, and that insight sometimes are not uh, maybe in uh, same pathways, which is insight provided by uh, energy importing countries uh, leading by international energy agencies. We definitely see uh, and uh, Professor Rima already uh, briefed uh, us on a recent uh, document from IEA regarding the future uh, pathways. Uh, IEA sees a uh, key pathway. Uh, and uh, from GCF point of view, we definitely see that uh, that document needs to be addressed with some caution. And today, we definitely see that ASEAN and the world are going into a very uh, severe period of time. Uh, we definitely see that uh, our forum today uh, meeting at the time when still many of uh, countries uh, experience uh, uh, new waves of pandemic, uh, still rollover vaccine is uh, not equally distributed around the world. At the same time, we see the efforts uh, of many countries, in particular in ASEAN, which before COVID-19 became a champions of leaders of economic development of the world to overcome this challenge and provide uh, reliable and sustainable development. According to our estimation, ASEAN uh, uh, in our post-pandemic period will uh, see quite uh, good economic growth uh, parameters. We see that uh, about uh, uh, 60 percent of global real GDP growth will be provided uh, from the region of Asia Pacific. And uh, it's very important uh, to mention that uh, according to our estimation, this economic growth needs to be supported with a reliable and affordable energy. Again, uh, in the documents we discussed uh, during last month uh, on uh, relation of uh, uh, net zero pathways, we definitely see that uh, at this time, Many agencies provide only one pathways, uh, and uh, uh, His uh, Excellencies uh, or ministers uh, on uh, today keynote speeches mentioned that uh, sometimes uh, only one pathway so cannot suit all. So definitely we see that ASEAN energy mix evolution is going to be uh, different from what we see, for example, in Europe. Definitely we see the strong uh, development of uh, natural gas uh, demand in the region, and again, uh, we believe that uh, uh, natural gas provides a strong support of uh, development of uh, new technology and new energy sources, including renewables in the region. Again, uh, I would like to address uh, the topic of uh, this uh, first session that uh, is the gas versus renewables in a viewpoint of uh, GCF gas supports the renewable developments, at least in ASEAN region. So definitely we don't see competition. We see quite a strong support uh, from natural gas industries, the development of renewables. And most of our GCF member countries are one of the leaders of development of renewables uh, technology on their territory. Again, we definitely uh, see that uh, energy demand trends are quite strong. Uh, particular uh, in overcoming uh, pandemic uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we definitely see that uh, most of uh, ASEAN countries are going to experience uh, hunger for cleaner energy, and uh, they see the natural gas as a primary solution and uh, low-hanging fruit 
uh, to solve uh, immediate uh, uh, issues uh, related to the uh, decarbonization of their energy balances, uh, not by 2050, but uh, in the coming decade. So very important message from GCF. We see that it's very strong policy and correct policy from many of ASEAN member countries to rely on natural gas as a fuel, which allow immediate results uh, on decarbonization of uh, energy mix of the country. So in our point of view, again, uh, we believe that uh, uh, natural gas demand in the coming uh, 30 years, uh, almost uh, triple uh, in some uh, countries, uh, but total uh, demand from ASEAN will reach uh, 350 BCM by 2050. So again, quite promising. Uh, numbers and we believe that all policy uh, supports this, uh, uh, especially taking consideration that uh, uh, many countries are now developing strong the infrastructure for import. Also today we talk a lot uh, uh, and learned a lot uh, from the policies in ASEAN member countries uh, related to development on uh, power sector, and definitely we fully agree that this policy uh, favorite in uh, development on renewables. Uh, we definitely see uh, strongest growth uh, in this part of uh, the sector. And of course, we see that uh, gas power plant and still will play a critical role regionally. And it's very important to underline that uh, we see that uh, gas power plants is important uh, component of, for the transition. Uh, particularly away from a very strong presence of coal-fired generation. And of course, uh, we definitely see that gas power generation based on dangerous gas production uh, have a quite uh, important role during the whole uh, period of energy transition and uh, can reach uh, approximately 35% of uh, power uh, generation mix in ASEAN. So again, these developments are clearly supported by all uh, calculations, I should say that uh, this calculation is done by GCF using our own uh, energy modeling, very data intensive. We provide uh, forecast for 34 uh, types of fuel, more than 140 uh, countries. Uh, twice a year, I report the results of modeling uh, to our ministers, and every second year we provide results to uh, leaders of gas exporting countries. So again, quite a strong understanding from gas exporters uh, development in ASEAN, uh, taking consideration uh, all recent policy. Uh, today, I also would like to mention that uh, we definitely observe a strong uh, wish of uh, ASEAN countries to diversify uh, types of uh, received uh, gases. We definitely see more uh, requests on future supply of hydrogen, ammonia, and uh, definitely GCF member countries uh, see this market as very promising, particularly in terms of supply of uh, blue hydrogen and blue ammonia. Again, in our outlook this year, we take a special focus on uh, estimating uh, the demand uh, in ASEAN countries. We definitely see um, that a huge portion of uh, uh, hydrogen, for example, can be absorbed uh, by consumers in ASEAN and uh, some uh, East Asian uh, countries. So again, uh, GCF member countries already start the cooperation negotiation, developing own programs on uh, development hydrogen export strategy. And sometimes we uh, internally see that uh, gas exporting countries forum in the future can uh, transform into more a uh, wider scope of uh, gases uh, uh, supplied uh, to the uh, consumers. And definitely we see the hydrogen perspective in Asia quite strong. And also I should say that technology allows us immediately, uh, for example, to supply another type of uh, uh, blue decarbonized gas as ammonia. Already some uh, test uh, supplies are uh, done, including from uh, GCF member countries. So again, we see that uh, uh, suppliers are ready for different scenarios and different policy development in ASEAN. Uh, again, uh, we should uh, consider very carefully, and today we've not uh, uh, talked uh, in the opening session about uh, prices. Again, this is very sensitive issues. We definitely see that uh, it's not much information is provided 
on how uh, energy transition uh, will affect the affordability of energy. We still uh, see that uh, more than uh, uh, 600 million people at the present do not have uh, access not to clean energy, it has no access to energy at all. Electricity is access is the biggest use. And we see that uh, in recent years, uh, quite a strong issue so with energy poverty start to be in the countries where it was uh, quite a stable situation. So again, we need to be careful uh, with uh, uh, programs and pathways we provide. Uh, and again, from GCF point of view, we see that uh, uh, natural gas with uh, known resource, uh, known uh, supply uh, pathways and known uh, technology it can be a good uh, uh, source of energy for the decams to come. And we definitely see the balance we provide in our outlook when 25% uh, of uh, primary energy demand in ASEAN will be covered by uh, gas, natural gas uh, with the decarbonized options, uh, including CCUS, including, as I said, hydrogen, blue ammonia. Uh, is a very, very uh, feasible option uh, and uh, GCF member countries are ready to provide uh, this amounts uh, to the markets in Asia. Why we, we say this, and I will talk about uh, on the next slide, but first of all, of course, we see ASEAN as a quite a strong market for LNG supplies and the GCF uh, member countries already uh, executed a number of uh, uh, supplies of so-called green LNG. Again, it's a very good option for decarbonization of gas supply to the region. And again, we are more than uh, proud to be one of the pioneers of countries who do such kind of options for the clients in the region. Again, in the forms of uh, gas trade, we see that uh, trade start to be more globalized. So many issues are now related uh, to uh, availability is solved with a sustainable supply of LNG. So again, customers uh, quite enjoy long-term, particular long-term uh, contracts with all the indexes. This is uh, again, one of example of uh, our GCF position and starting from 2001, when our leaders decided to establish GCF, it was a point that we believe that is more optimal choice of clients uh, to uh, receive a supply, uh, particular from GCF member countries, on the base of long-term contracts with all index. So again, we see, of course, uh, development of new types of uh, uh, price, uh, and again, uh, GCF member countries uh, are very flexible in terms of uh, supply uh, on different conditions. So again, we see the global gas trade uh, going to expand. We definitely see that ASEAN and uh, East Asia is going to be one of the key destinations for uh, particular for LNG. Also, a very important item I would like to raise that LNG trade uh, allows uh, quite a strong uh, international cooperation because a lot of uh, facilities, for particular for LNG carriers, are located in uh, East Asia and ASEAN. Uh, countries uh, from GCF have a good relations uh, on purchasing equipment, purchasing these carriers. So again, it's a win-win situation to develop uh, this uh, sector of economy. So again, from GCF member countries, we see this is a good opportunity, not only talk about energy cooperation, but uh, talk about more wider infrastructural and uh, industry cooperation. For ASEAN, again, I would like to say that uh, uh, according to our estimation, the region uh, in uh, you know, period of next five, six years uh, will become a net importer of natural gas. This is very important uh, point uh, uh, and message from GCF outlook. We definitely see that uh, energy transition will require more natural gas. Uh, again, this uh, import uh, can be uh, supported by GCF uh, member countries. And again, on many occasions, we uh, proved uh, for uh, readiness uh, to meet this demand. Again, according to our estimation, uh, around 180 BCM of natural gas need to be imported to the uh, ASEAN member countries. And uh, again, uh, if we have more time and uh, we definitely have a more detailization for each country, how this uh, gas can be uh, supplied. So uh, briefly, this is what I want to touch upon in my opening intervention. 
I would like to again thank uh, uh, Area for inviting GCF. We are very proud uh, to be your partner and uh, definitely uh, under the leadership of uh, His Excellency Professor Nishimura, uh, Secretary and also Secretary General Dr. Sinturin. Our two organizations have a quite uh, significant and uh, successful cooperation period starting from 2016 uh, signature of MOU. And we are looking forward to support uh, area on uh, this uh, in the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Dimitri, for giving a very uh, good background on this uh, outlook of natural gas demand and supply in the region of ASEAN uh, as well as for, uh, for the world. Uh, I think uh, to all the participants, I think you can actually already start to drop some of the question after the four panelists uh, finish their, their uh, talk, actually we can uh, select some question to address to you. Uh, meanwhile, I just proceed to invite uh, Pat Benny from ACE for, for uh, uh, the next presentation. Uh, uh, Benny, the floor is yours, please. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Han Po Min. Um, thank you very much uh, to Area for inviting the ASEAN Center for Energy uh, to join this important event. Uh, Congratulations, area as well uh, for successfully organized this annual um, is um, Asia Energy Forum that provide a significant insight for the discussion on the energy in the region. Um, for the next five or seven minutes, um, I would like to share with all on the renewable energy situation and the transition in the ASEAN power sector. So much of the focus of my uh, presentation will be on the power sector. Uh, this is based on the ASEAN power updates uh, that was released last week. And um, I can also say that uh, much of the information that I'm going to share is in line or relate with the presentation from uh, Prof. Jun Arima earlier on the situation in each ASEAN member state and how we are moving to the direction of the energy uh, transition. Next slide, please. A, a, a brief introduction uh, for um, anyone who's not familiar with ASEAN Center for Energy. We are representing the interests of the 10 countries in the Southeast Asia region on the energy cooperation. Um, Dr. Han Pumi mentioned uh, various energy issues that we need to address and as 10 countries in this region has the uh, uh, various economic development, various uh, potential on energy. Of course, it also various uh, uh, goals. Uh, but it's all integrated to address the issue, energy security, accessibility, affordability, and sustainability for all. Next slide, please. And you may skip this one. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is the thing that I would like to uh, probably share with all of the audience today. Um, in 2020, the total installed power capacity in ASEAN cumulatively has reached 222 gigawatt. Uh, there are three countries that are majority accounted uh, for around 66% uh, of the total capacity. We have Indonesia, we have Vietnam, and we have Thailand. And three major fields that also contribute for more than 80% of the total installed capacity in ASEAN is coal. Um, steel coal is the highest one. We have also gas is a, a second highest uh, contribution on the installed power capacity. And then we have hydro. And then continues with the other uh, energy types on renewable energy. In ASEAN, we classify all uh, kind of renewable energy, including hydro as a renewable energy, regardless of the size of the hydro itself. Next slide, please. And uh, from that 282 total uh, last year uh, of the capacity, 
Round 22 is a new capacity added in 2020. So, and this is a story that where I can present how the ASEAN moved to the direction of the energy transition. 82% of the ASEAN new capacity last year, it's coming from renewable energy be it coming from the hydro or be it coming from the solar or, or, or wind and other type of energy, but 82% of the ASEAN new capacity is coming from renewable energy. You can might see on the uh, picture on the right, that's uh, we install cumulatively more than 11 gigawatt solar and continue with the hydro is around six gigawatt. And this is much of the contribute significantly with uh, Vietnam that shoring its capacity on the solar and also Laos where it's uh, continuously become the battery uh, for the region with their hydro capacity. Next slide, please. And uh, the significant achievement on having uh, a large amount of renewable energy in the ASEAN installed capacity last year has contributed to the uh, significant progress on the RE share in our ASEAN installed power capacity. So perhaps some of you is familiar that ASEAN want to achieve 23% of their energy mix coming from renewable energy by 2025. And specific to the power sector, the ASEAN wants to have 35% of their uh, installed power capacity is coming from renewable energy. Uh, so 35% is our target. And yet last year, we are already at the point of 33.5%. So it's only 1.5% gap from the 2020 target. Um, most of it uh, uh, before coming from the hydro and bioenergy, but then 2015 solar and wind began to increase uh, sharply. And this uh, effort is uh, translated in all of the 10 countries um, where their increase on renewable energy is also significantly improving, um, including like Cambodia with the 54.8%, where the Excellency Petrovina will share more, more on that one. And other countries, despite uh, their limit potential on renewable energy, but it's also managed to increase their share. Next slide, please. And all of it is uh, contributed to the solar and wind. So these two main resources that significantly change the landscape. For the last five years, we see that there's almost equal amount of the installed capacity coming from renewable energy and coming from the uh, fossil fuel. So the fossil fuel is, is installed around 50 gigawatt from the last five years, while renewable energy is around 45%. So it's still like a, almost a similar. Amount. But you see on the picture on the left with the green part that how the renewable energy is changing the games, continuously increase, in the installed capacity since 2019 and 2020 compared to the fossil fuels. 2020 is the pandemic year. So it's also show that the renewable energy is a, one of the resilience option for the ASEAN for this uh, economic recovery. And uh, this is where you can also see that what country is driving this kind of, 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 uh, of uh, renewable energy uh, improvement. Next slide. And as we are uh, eager for continuously move towards the energy transition, um, the ASEAN member states continue to install renewable energy. Um, of course, we are very much aware of the challenge on the energy transition. And again, um, as also Prof. Uh, Jun Arima mentioned that each country has its different circumstance, a different situation different pace in moving towards the energy transition. So of course, uh, it, it, we need to respect that kind of, uh, of a pace in each country. And also uh, there is a need to embark the all kind of fuels to address the issue that we have earlier. 
energy accessibility, energy affordability, energy security, and security uh, sustainability for all. Um, in your short term, this is based on the existing power development plan. So already being committed by the countries until 2025 on the power sectors. We see that 60% of the new capacity will coming from renewable energy. So it will help ASEAN to achieve beyond their targets on the uh, RE share. Uh, but yet, we also recognize there's a number of the fossil fuels like particular on coal and natural gas will play a significant role to, uh, to uh, support the, the resilient system, uh, the, the, the best lot system of the ASEAN uh, as a whole. Um, so uh, that will uh, conclude my presentation and I hope it could also give you an insight that how ASEAN moved into the energy transition. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Pat Benny. I think you already uh, set a very good uh, progress for ASEAN. So we, we are very exciting to see that ASEAN are moving um, in the right direction to achieve the target by 2025, even exceed that renewable target by 2.5%. I think this is very exciting you uh, for all ASEAN uh, uh, member states. Uh, I think there will be a lot of questions coming, uh, hopefully. Uh, in terms of how we're going to achieve further uh, toward uh, net zero emission, uh, those we're going to achieve by the 2025 and 2030, or uh, but a future target need to be uh, reset it to ensure that ASEAN as a group can achieve the carbon neutrality in the future. By the way, thank you so much, uh, Pat Benny, for this uh, uh, good news. Uh, the next, I would like to invite uh, His Excellency Victor Jonah. Uh, to give his view on the Cambodian development on the general policies of Cambodian to support renewable uh, or other uh, policies that uh, we want to learn from Cambodian as well. Uh, Excellency Victor Zona, the floor is your please. Very good morning, everyone. My respect to Dr. Han Puman, moderator for our first session. All panel, ladies and gentlemen. First, we would like to express our sincere thanks to the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia area for organizing this forum, which focus on low carbon energy transition for our region. We would like to update to the forum. In Cambodia, current power generation meet composition of fossil fuel, Coal and oil represent 32 percent. Renewable energy, hydro, solar, and biomass represent 43 percent of the total installed capacity, and the power import represent 24 percent. At the moment, Cambodia is under formulated a long-term power master plan, 2021 up to 2040, with the concept of integration of renewable energy energy efficiency to the formulation. The study is going to complete by November this year. Inside, we can say that the combined cycle gas power plant and hydropower plant will be play a major role in the power generation and supplies. Those development will be contributed to lower carbon and meeting the regional energy transition roadmap. We would like to update also that uh, in 2019, the Royal Government of Cambodia decided to integrate 500 megawatt solar farm connected to the grid. And today, 350 megawatt of the 500 megawatt already put in operation and linked to the grid. And the rest 150 megawatt is under construction and would be completed by 2022. The application of national energy efficiency policy 2021-2030 be also a part to contribute for low carbon and energy transition. So our policy is to supply power to all economic sector and people. And just like to inform you that to now we already uh, supply power to all villages, uh, all, among all villages of Cambodian, 
97.5% already connected to the grid. And for household, 81% already uh, get access to electricity. Essentially, ladies and gentlemen, I think I may stop my intervention now and be back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, His Excellency Victor Zona, to uh, share your insight from uh, Cambodian policy development to support renewable, as well as uh, a report about the progress of energy access in Cambodia. It's very exciting to see a rapid uh, uh, electricity access in Cambodia in a very uh, in, in a very short time. Uh, congratulations for that. Uh, we will come back to you, Excellency. And, uh, but we need, let me proceed to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Norasikin, uh, going to uh, talk about the uh, Malaysian case as well as uh, ASEAN case, uh, about renewable development as well as the role of the biomass to support uh, the ASEAN, uh, particular in Malaysian case in ASEAN, uh, energy trans transition. Uh, Dr. Norasikin, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pomin. A very good day to all uh, distinguished uh, guests and participants. I hope everyone uh, is, uh, is in the good health. So uh, as mentioned by Dr. Pumin, uh, so my topic today is on the role of biomass in energy transition in Malaysia. And also I will touch a little bit on the ASEAN perspective as these uh, resources is considered uh, one of the main abundant renewable energy in this region. Next slide, please. So Malaysia has uh, taken uh, several initiatives uh, to diversify the country's energy sources and a revenue stream away from oil since the early 1980s. So this uh, transition of the policy, if you look uh, based on the figure, uh, the implementation can be divided into three phases, which are from 2001, 2010, uh, we can consider as the initial transition phase from 2011-2016 as the acceleration phase and 2016 onwards as the sustainable development phase. So various programs and uh, incentives has been uh, introduced to drive the renewable energy uh, deployment in the country, such as a, re a small renewable energy program, SREP and a fit in tariff or FIT. So the biomass power generation is continuously developed uh, as you can see in the below, below of the figure, but still in the slow progress compared to the solar photovoltaic due to the many problems limited its scale up. So recently, the government uh, has also revised the current plan to raise uh, the national target of renewable energy in electricity generation mix, which is up to 31% by 2025. As mentioned by uh, Pak Benji just now, we already in Malaysia achieved about 24%. So the government increased uh, a new target, which is 31% by 2025 and 40% by 2035. And it is hoped that this time, uh, more priority and incentive will be also given to the biomass uh, energy sources. Next slide, please. So biomass uh, become one of the main uh, contributor of renewable uh, energy sources in this region. So the main force is the action of all countries in the region uh, to combat the climate change, where the needs to maintain the global temperature below two degrees Celsius by reducing about 50 to 85% uh, greenhouse gas emission by 2050. So the renewable uh, energy has been the energy mix for all the countries as in Malaysia, so the contribution of biomass is, is still small, which is about 3.5%. So the dominant fuel uh, source is still coal and natural gas, as you can see uh, in the figure also. So Malaysia currently has around 13.5 uh, gigawatt or 40% of installed uh, coal-fired capacity. And it's a monthly coal-fired power generation average about 9.3 gigawatt in 2020. So the trend, I think, is quite similar to the other ASEAN countries, such as Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. Next slide, next slide please. So bioenergy fixed stock uh, in Malaysia is abundant, which about uh, 100 million uh, tonne from agricultural waste forest residue and uh, municipal waste. Agriculture waste uh, represent 91% of the biomass. And uh, most 
is derived from palm oil milk residues such as empty fruit bunches, palm mesocarp fiber, palm kernel shell, and palm oil milk effluent. Malaysia actually is the second largest palm oil producer with total uh, plantation area about 5.6 million hectares with 485 mills. So the estimated installed capacity potential from biomass generated at the mills using the empty fruit bunches, palm mesocarp fiber, and palm kernel shell is between 2,400 uh, and 7,460 uh, 7, megawatt, and about 400 uh, to 480 a megawatt for biogas from palm oil mill effluent. So if the government target is about 17,000 megawatt installed capacity renewable energy, the biomass has a potential to contribute at least 50% of the target. So the price of the feedstock uh, also uh, estimated quite stable uh, with a minimal increment from the year 2020 to 2050. Next. Based on the uh, academic uh, perspective, uh, many studies have been conducted to optimize and innovate the use of biomass as power generation. So among uh, action uh, plan should be established is to catalyst bioenergy generation by, uh, for example, here enhance uh, bioenergy conversion efficiency and waste management. And number two, uh, biomass co-firing connected with carbon captured storage or CCS in existing coal power plant. And number three, biogas conversion to biomethane or biocompressed natural gas. And also uh, to develop a large scale biomass power plant. So the action that I want to highlight here is a biomass co-firing with the CCS in the existing coal power plant. Um, Malaysia has a target to reduce actually coal capacity by 4.2 gigawatt, as you can see in the figure, by 2039. So the government uh, plans to retire around 7 gigawatt of uh, coal-fired capacity by the year. So as the fuel, as the use of coal will be reduced, the potential of biomass to replace uh, this fuel has to be considered as many mills, actually palm oil mills, are located surrounding the current uh, coal power plants. So the other country, uh, such as Indonesia, has also taken a step uh, to achieve a near decarbonization by 2050 by utilizing renewables such as biomass, as well as a co-firing coal with biomass, according to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC. So the, the country uh, is expected to have 13 gigawatt of biomass and 23 gigawatt of biomass coal co-firing installed power generation capacity connected to the carbon capture and storage by 2050. Next. Co-firing uh, is defined as a combustion of uh, two or more uh, different fuels in a single furnace. Generally, uh, the main benefit of co-firing uh, is the reduction of fossil fuel uh, CO2 emission from electricity generation, as coal is the most carbon dense fossil fuel. So co-firing uh, biomass at low, medium, and dedicated biomass level can lead to a decrease of GSG emission. So when a CCS is added uh, to the medium and dedicated or retrofitted biomass scenario, this is a potential to have a negative uh, impact of the emission. For direct uh, co-firing of coal with uh, raw empty fruit bunches, the capital cost could be as low as uh, US dollar 500 per kilowatt of the capital of the installed capacity. Uh, if we compare in contrast, the current investment cost to build a new CHP medium scale biomass plant, uh, which uh, the range is about 10 to 15 megawatt, is between 3,500 and uh, 6,800 US dollar per kilowatt. So there is a different use of the cost actually between the existing, uh, if, we, if we put the coal, uh, coal firing and uh, with a new investment. So finance, financiers uh, will be more convinced uh, to invest in coal firing as it's offer low cost and risk with a shorter payback uh, period. Furthermore, there are no requirement to build a new power plant and no additional downstream costs for grid connection and grid reinforcement since these facilities are already in the place uh, at existing coal power station. So coal uh, firing uh, biomass with coal at one typical coal fired uh, will replace almost 3,000 
uh, this is the potential 3,000 ton of coal per year could uh, divert up to about 5,000 ton of biomass from landfill and also it is expected to reduce net carbon uh, dioxide uh, emission by more than 8,000 ton per year. Next. So the issues and uh, challenges uh, for the biomass, uh, biomass uh, co-firing is quite similar in the region. So among the highlight, highlighted issues are poor fuel, fuel economy, which is uh, coal biomass co-firing is not very profitable thus it is reliance on policy support uh, is very high and unstable biomass supply negative uh, effect on the boiler because of the because of the low calorific value and a high moisture content of the biomass and then uh, imperfection of the relevant supporting policies difficulties in uh, government uh, supervision the monitoring and verification are also one of the critical issue. Appropriate governance and sequestration is also critical. And also there is a limited understanding of the kinetics of CO2 uptakes. Next. So the greatest challenge for carbon capture storage deployment in Malaysia is actually a funding. So however, CCS will be a will be of increasing interest to Malaysia due to the resource and power industries that form the basis of its economy and the increasing CO2 content of its remaining uh, natural gas uh, reserve. So the re recommendation for the CCS uh, implementation, uh, first the double counting measures should be given and then a binding blend in targets to achieve a sub-target for advanced biofuel would secure a market share and also the tech incentive and uh, and also uh, production support of fit in tariff uh, also one of the recommendation next based on the current uh, scenario the proposed policy or intervention needed for the for the biomass co-firing uh, first man to mandate the biomass CCS. So the government would impose carbon tax or standard to encourage shift from the fossil fuel power plant towards using biomass and carbon capture, uh, carbon capture and uh, storage system. And also the funding uh, bio CCS and also persuasion of uh, bio CCS, which is uh, to convene multi-stakeholders and industry uh, roundtable for bio CCS transition. And the biomass-based uh, renewable energy target can be achieved with all the support, not only from the policymakers, but also the industry itself. So the recommendation to materialize the deployment, uh, number one, uh, the recommendation is to optimize the biomass purchase system, such as initiate local and regional supply chain, long fuel contracts uh, agreement, uh, revision of the power purchase agreement on biomass stock and the power generation and strengthen uh, research on coal fired couple biomass power generation technology uh, for example uh, here is we have we should have a proof of concept uh, uh, with the demonstration plan and reasonably plan the location of the coal biomass co-firing power plant uh, which is uh, to find uh, the nearby existing coal power plant uh, with the uh, palm oil mill plantation and mills and also to have the state support and supervision which is uh, to have a stakeholder engagement from various organizations. Uh, I think with that uh, thank you uh, for inviting me today and I am very happy to have a further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Dr. Norasikin. I think you provide a very important message uh, for the role of biomass. And most importantly, you talk about coal firing. That's one of the examples that it became very uh, feasible in the scale up of these uh, coal firing uh, without, I think it's more, even more economic viable than just biomass power plant itself. So I think this is very important. Uh, I think reducing uh, coal in the futures by increasing coal firing is one of the best options for ASEAN energy transition. I think this is a very good message for ASEAN, uh, why continue to use coal, but at the same time to reduce emission by increasing uh, coal firing with biomass. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Nurasikin. Um, uh, 
please uh, drop this question if you have. Uh, in the meantime, because also we we because of the time, I will proceed the question until if I don't have received any question, I will want to ask each of panelists one question. Uh, let me start with Dr. Dimitris. Uh, as you highlight, actually your predict uh, outlook. I think it's say a very uh, similar trend of our outlook and other outlook for ASEAN. I think uh, that the role of gas, natural gas will increase uh, its share in the uh, future ASEAN energy mix. Uh, but one, more, one of the important uh, that we want to ask that how to ensure the clean uh, use of the natural gas, uh, whether it's from the upstream, if, if I, if you can share your perspective uh, from the supply chain, how you you decarbonize natural gas from the upstream, uh, as well as if you may have any idea, but mostly on the upstream, and as well as the uh, downstream, if you like, and if you can set, uh, uh, share your view on, on this, it will be very important because those natural gas is cleaner than than coal, but it still emit emission. In that case, I think our role to ensure that natural gas will be used more cleanly. Do, how your view on, on this in support as in energy transition? Dr. Dimitri, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Pomin, for this uh, insightful start of the session. And question is very important because we are meeting uh, less than two months before COP26 uh, meeting in Glasgow, where we see that it is a very high momentum of uh, global climate efforts. And the GCF uh, as a uh, responsible team of uh, gas exporting countries is uh, preparing very strongly uh, to announce the voice of natural gas. And first of all, to answer the blames that uh, gas industry stand aside of uh, global climate uh, efforts is totally not correct. Global gas industry and particular GCF member countries in the front of uh, fight with uh, climate change. And definitely we see uh, that uh, coming decades, very important period when uh, uh, gas industry will provide options, effective options uh, on uh, decarbonization of gas. And that options and technology behind that options are already available. I should say that, uh, for example, in case of GCF, uh, starting from 2016, we work on uh, our environmental knowledge and solutions initiative with uh, certain practical actions. So we're not only talking in theoretic, but also in actions in all our member countries. There is a, um, basically quarterly meetings on sharing the practical experience, particularly in CCUS, you know, in Qatar, all uh, plans for expansions going along with the technological solution on CCUS uh, technologies. So again, consumers which will receive uh, LNG from these member countries of GCF will receive already uh, with uh, uh, so-called green LNG. So this option is available right today. Another big uh, point which we would like to say is that uh, beside uh, CCUS, CCS, we quite actively work on the platform of uh, G20 because we see that uh, industrial and economic advanced countries should take the lead. Uh, unfortunately, we have only one member uh, in that club. And nevertheless, uh, GCF is active for participants and we are looking forward for G20 presidency in Indonesia next year. We definitely see that a lot of potential is uh, uh, lies uh, in uh, decarbonization of gas uh, in terms of uh, carbon circle economy, which is one of the important initiatives of G20 uh, presidency in Saudi Arabia last year. So again, GCF has actively worked on that. Uh, and again, uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a quite uh, key component of all our discussion, uh, how to decarbonize gas. We definitely see potential with existing technology on blue hydrogen. Uh, already uh, all our member countries have a hydrogen program. For example, uh, our member country, Russia, have already export potential program 
of 2 million tons by 2035 and uh, with a partnership from East Asia and ASEAN countries. So again, these uh, developments are going on uh, quite effectively. So I would like to summarize that again, there is misconception that gas exporters, gas producers are stand aside of this use of uh, uh, climate uh, efforts. At the same time, uh, it's very important to realize that the uh, gas industry stands inside and uh, provide practical actions with available today, not in the future, not in 2035, not in 2040, exactly the same time. And uh, we already have a good track of uh, examples how increment of natural gas consumption country allows to immediately uh, decarbonize and reduce uh, uh, carbon footprint of uh, energy mix. And last uh, comments, uh, because uh, these days a lot of questions regarding the methane emission. Also in GCF, we have uh, quite a strong program on uh, monitoring. And again, I should say that technologically, it's a point of one or two years when uh, all gas industry downstream, upstream will uh, have a good monitoring system. We work with uh, satellite companies. Uh, just a couple months ago, we have a good uh, uh, exchange of practice. So again, uh, we think that the methane emission from gas industry is an overhyped uh, uh, point. And again, industry is very seriously address this, so very seriously. And technology we use is now uh, on place. And again, I think uh, one, two years, uh, these uh, topics will be out of table. So again, very important to uh, summarize that the GCF uh, gas exporters are providing a full efforts uh, to uh, so far uh, climate uh, challenges and again i'm very thankful for your questions so it's very important to others uh, on this forum. Thank, thank you thank you so much dr dimitri uh, this is very exciting to hear from uh, you uh, about the commitment from the uh, uh, exporting countries and industry that they are having strategy in place to find way to decarbonize the uh, uh, emission at the upstream of natural gas. Uh, I think we will come back to you. Uh, thank you so much for, for this. Uh, we have two questions uh, in, in proceeding, but let uh, the next question, I think the panelists, uh, uh, let's say Dr. Norasikin Pakbeni and His Excellency Jonah can share the, the view. One question from Dr. Rudy. His question, how do we initiate change in behavior on energy demand? from fossil fuel uh, based energy to renewable by countries. Is there any implementation of shifting behavior, a chain knowledge study, both private and government in the region? Uh, basically, uh, the question is about the shifting behavior from, from fossil fuel based to renewable. Do you see any uh, changes in ASEAN? Uh, let's say in policy making as well as private and government in ASEAN. Uh, please share your view uh, about it. Maybe Pak Benny can share first. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Umin. Um, yeah, um, I think in, in general, the, the, there are many existing initiatives or, or, or policies being implemented by, by the government uh, to uh, initiates this change in the peer behavior, uh, be it like implementing for more um, energy efficiency household plans or giving more incentive for having more um, renewable energy. Uh, but if I allow, I think what I would like um, to add more is uh, the, the, the important or the role of the citizen, as you're talking about the behavior, so it's meaning all of us, uh, the importance of the citizen to lead the energy transition. So citizen engagement begin, begins by raising the energy and climate literacy and awareness among communities through local event campaigns and dialogue. And um, although this stage on the enable a lowest degree of involvement, it is fundamental to improve the community knowledge of the energy policies, technologies, best practice, and, and the new idea. Well-informed citizens can shift the community's perception and ultimately increase the level of the 
a some kind of renewable energy or uh, implementation of the uh, energy uh, efficiency. The low acceptance has been shown to hamper the clean energy deployment uh, as indicated by increasing class between energy project developers or the local uh, community. Uh, other uh, what, two examples, perhaps what I could share is um, a recent electricity bill source, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines has seen a rise in the citizen participation. Uh, motivated to reduce the electricity bills, many Filipinos have joined the prosumer movement by installing solar panel on the roof. Um, and to enable Filipinos, including a low-income household, to become prosumer, many local organizations have lobbied the energy regulator to facilitate the community's growing aspiration. Uh, such a focus has borne fruit. Uh, recent policy amendment by the Energy Regulatory Commission includes the launch of the net metering program, attractive incentive, and other support. Another example is Indonesia, a local nonprofit, um, IBECA, perhaps many of you have known, urged the government to allow the national grid operator to buy electricity from independent small-scale hydropower plant that the organization had been pushing for over the last decade. And this effort too has been successful. So a newly amended law has been passed to accommodate the community-led renewable energy projects in the national grid. Ibeka itself has built a 70 small, I think, I think around 70 small and micro hydropower plant in Indonesia supplying electricity to more than a million people in rural and remote areas. So this is an example how the behavior is being changed in the energy transition. I thank you so here. Much. Yes, thank you so much, Tabani. This is a very nice uh, practical example. I think it's for uh, the progress of the behavior change uh, toward, I think, more renewable that you gave very practical in terms of how Philippine case uh, I think the sudden increase of uh, solar panel in Asian country is exciting. Uh, I think because of time, we have two more uh, questions remain. I think one question uh, will back to uh, Dr. Dimitri and then one question for Dr. Nora Sikin. I will ask the last question for His Excellency Victor Zona. So the next question, let me proceed to uh, Dr. Nora Sikin first before uh, ask question back to Dr. Dimitri uh, from Professor Chuna Rima. Uh, Dr. Nurasikin, there is a question on the uh, biomass. Basically, uh, the question is one technical concern with biomass retrofitting has to do with storage and handling. For example, long-term storage of wet biomass may be concerned. Naturally, this means that there will be a variation on the type of biomass but how do we store it efficiently? Are there general conclusion for handling and storage for all type of biomass? Uh, this question is in, in terms of how, uh, how you store uh, the, the biomass, handling it in, to ensure the quality of biomass uh, technically. Uh, could you please address this point, Dr. Nurasiki? Okay, uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Pumin. Okay, this question uh, for Brian. Yeah, the way. okay, yeah. Uh, okay, bye. okay, thank you uh, for the question, uh, Mr. Barian. Uh, if we look at uh, the example of the empty fruit bunches previously, because the moisture content uh, is very high, which is about almost 70% moisture content uh, for the EFB, empty fruit bunches. Uh, this type of uh, biomass uh, is, is need, uh, we need to reduce actually the moisture content. So uh, the current practice, I think they just uh, dry it uh, in the ambient, okay, ambient uh, condition. Uh, then they, they just store it at the, the, mill, the, the, mill, the mill site. Uh, but however, uh, for the long term, I think uh, for the general, uh, also for the other type of uh, biomass, we can uh, make like a pallet or oh? pallet of the or uh, uh, we can briquette make a briquette of the uh, as a fuel as a new fuel uh, sources so it's easily for us to handling and and also to storage for a long term so these uh, briquettes and also the pallet I think the technology is quite uh, developed 
so we can uh, we can uh, transform uh, the, the 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 fresh uh, biomass waste to the pellet so and also this can be uh, export also the potential to export to the other countries or nearby uh, nearby uh, countries so it will be a, a best solution i think for this uh, uh, how to handle and uh, do a storage uh, for all type of all type of biomass currently thank you thank you so much dr noraskin uh, to to respond to this how to ensure the quality of biomass technically by uh, yeah. i think transforming to high quality in in terms of the brackets uh, I think high quality for caloric value of yes. biomass. Uh, okay. Thanks for that. I think we can discuss further if we have time. Uh, by the way, um, uh, uh, let uh, uh, one more, two more questions. I think one question back to Dr. Demetris from a uh, question from Professor Chunarima. What do you think about the recent trend where multilateral development bank stop financing? for upstream gas development for the sake of carbon neutrality. If what happened if the banking stop financing upstream na natural gas development? What, what will, 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 will happen in that situation for just in the sake of carbon neutrality? How will be your view? Again, uh, I would like to uh, thank Professor Rima for this uh, very critical point of investment and uh, how industry is going to overcome uh, this uh, period when basically uh, for the sake of uh, some uh, pathways which we believe uh, goes uh, in the wrong direction. So it's more punishing oil and gas industry and uh, not allowed to continue uh, effective uh, supply of energy to the markets. We definitely believe that the immediate response is uh, going to be that uh, countries, particularly now we see in Africa, are going to uh, cooperate and create their own funds to finance projects. So again, this is uh, not uh, uh, something which is not prepared. Again, uh, many industries are uh, uh, continue to uh, work effectively with the governments uh, to support uh, this development. Again, we believe that these decisions are made with a misconcept uh, based on uh, so-called backward modeling. We definitely argue with this uh, concept, uh, particularly again uh, with IA, we definitely see the only pathway they provided in their net zero uh, report uh, is uh, not uh, interpreted well by policymakers. Uh, so again, uh, from GCF, uh, also with our colleagues with OPEC, we address these issues. And again, uh, I should say that uh, most of these uh, pathways are going from uh, European countries where they have a totally different uh, situation, totally different uh, goals. For ASEAN, uh, we definitely see the strong economic growth. We definitely see strong economic uh, development in the coming decades. It's totally opposite situation in European Union. There is a totally different uh, path of uh, uh, demand for energy. Uh, we definitely see there is a decline of energy demand. In ASEAN, all forecasters see the increase. Uh, we definitely see that these uh, statements uh, are mislead as an audience, it's uh, not uh, sustainable in terms of uh, providing affordable energy for all. So again, it's a contradict uh, quite a lot. And again, as I mentioned in my first intervention, gas exporters uh, and the gas industry as a whole are not a stand uh, behind. There is no climate deniers in the industry. So all working together to decarbonize gas. And a very important also item we not discussed today, but it's, uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, development in the GCF is the digitalization of industry. We develop quite a strongly uh, so-called digital twins. So my team is now working a lot to, with artificial intelligence technology to provide a realistic picture of how our energy system is going to develop. Because again, system is too comprehensive. It's too easy to say that uh, natural gas em still emits uh, without considering uh, quite uh, uh, alternative, which brings even more uh, difficulties. And we are talking, of course, on the reports which is uh, coming related to development of uh, 
batteries, uh, new technologies related to renewables. So quite a comprehensive system uh, needs to be considered very carefully without this uh, strong uh, statement that, okay, we stop immediately and uh, we don't see any positive reaction from the market. So we definitely see the price volatility after such kind of statement is uh, one of the factor we need to avoid in the future. Again, we believe that area with your economic research, we use it widely in our studies, uh, more realistic in evaluation. So again, we are very proud to, to receive uh, your outlook. We definitely see this as a book which need to be considered. Again, we call in for cooperation, and this is one of the core action of our forum cooperation and uh, uh, discussion on pathways, not one pathway for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dimitri, to, I think, clarify this point, I think that there, there's, uh, I think your confirmation that the uh, gas exporting country are ready uh, to decarbonize the emission from gas. This is a very good, good news. I think that uh, there should be no any misperception toward this uh, clean you or natural gas uh, by I think these upstream and exporting country putting effort to decarbonize uh, gas. Uh, this is very important message. Uh, I think uh, before we go into final uh, of this session, uh, I would like to invite His Excellency Victor Zona to share his uh, view of uh, uh, sudden increase also on the solar development in Cambodia. I think Cambodian has suddenly increased solar uh, power uh, in these, uh, I think, in the energy mix, in the power generation mix. And uh, to highlight that, I think Vietnam also set a very good example for the ASEAN country for certain increase. But Cambodia is not behind. I think it's a, uh, those, the, in terms of renewable, Cambodia have very high share already because of hydropower. But a sudden increase of solar, it's very exciting that if Excellency Victor Zona can share the example uh, a little bit how the story is going in terms of why solar uh, farm can come up very quickly also in Cambodia. Excellency Victor Zona, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Puman. Yes, of course. Uh, at the moment, there are uh, increasing of solar energy into the power system of Cambodia. As I informed before, in 2019, the government has decided to integrate more 500 megawatt solar farm connecting to the grid, and already 350 megawatt already linked and put in operation. Another 150 megawatt is also under construction. We would like to inform you that the, we formulate our master plan, long-term master plan, 2021 up to 2040, and we also integrate the concept of increased renewable energy into the roadmap of development. And uh, of course, the tariff of solar energy that EDC, the state utility, have signed TPA together with the IPP, it most competed with other conventional energy, such as um, many different of uh, PPA, EDC have signed in the range of some is 3.8 same US a kilowatt hour, and some is six cent, and some is 7.6 cent. So, of course, the tariff of solar energy already compete with conventional energy. And by the way, we would like to inform you that Cambodia is a sanitary country that we have signed the Paris Agreement. In this case, we have obligation to lower down the emission into the atmosphere. So in this case, other, sol other solar energy or wind energy, at, at the moment also we would like to inform to the forum that the EDC is under negotiate about the uh, buying electricity from wind energy. So uh, we hope that uh, in the long and in the medium term, the sharing of renewable energy such as solar and wind would be increased more in this case. That is my, uh, my contribution to the forum. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Excellency Victor Jonah. I think this is a very practical example from Cambodia and how Cambodia accelerate uh, renewable, particularly solar currently, and also the future will be 
also uh, we have a uh, win into uh, power generation mix. Uh, this is very exciting for, for, for ASEAN, uh, particularly uh, example from, from Cambodia. I think let me wrap up first and uh, uh, this session. It, was, uh, it is a very wonderful session and discussion among the excellent panel uh, panelists. And uh, I think the key message has been highlighted by all uh, uh, panelists basically that the role of natural gas will be key in supporting ASEAN energy transition. A clear message has come out from exporting country that you hear from Dr. Dimitri that there are high commitment in decarbonizing gas uh, from the exporting and industry uh, uh, for the natural gas. And also it's important also that to highlight that uh, uh, Pak Benny has highlighted clearly in terms of how ASEAN have progressed to achieve renewable energy targets. And this is also very exciting. We should congratulate uh, ASEAN commitment and uh, their target achieve and even uh, exceeding this target by 2025. And also we, we learn practically from Cambodian of good news how uh, Cambodian can able to accelerate those they already have very high share of hydropowers in energy system, but solar, which is the intermittent uh, energy, uh, renewable energy can have very high share, a very sudden increase as well as in the, they, they plan to increase further from other renewable energy such as wind as well. And also most importantly, we heard that the coal firing, uh, coal with biomass is key. In this uh, uh, ASEAN energy transition, this will lower emission in, uh, the case is from Malaysia, but it can be practical and applied to all ASEAN as a group. And let me thank all the excellent panelists for your view. And let, I think all of us congratulate all the panelists and we hope that we're going to see you again. And thank you so much all the panelists uh, member today for contributing to this uh, session. Thank you so much. And I would like to turn this uh, floor back to uh, Lydia. Uh, Lydia, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Feline. And thank you so much. Yeah. a big thank you to all of our esteemed panelists today for a very interesting and engaging session on the roles of natural gas and renewables as uh, part of ASEAN's uh, energy transition. So we are now scheduled for the afternoon break, and we will convene, reconvene in about one hour at 1.30 p.m. Brunei time. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Indian, all panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>